someone had asked me when I reached my 50s to assess my life, I would have said that I had achieved a decent measure of fulfillment, both personally and professionally. Beyond that, I would say I don't choose to delve. Not that I was afraid of uncovering some dark side of my character. But I always feel if something seems to be working, leave it alone. That's the opening to the 1988 movie Another Woman, written and directed by Woody Allen. It's about a philosophy professor played by Jenna Rollins, who, in her 50s, ends up delving and discovers that her life adds up to less than she thought. This is a uh, special episode of the Virtual Memory Show. There are no interviews this time, although you'll hear from a whole bunch of past guests of the show. I turned 50 years old today, and I wanted to mark that occasion somehow. And since the podcast is my primary way of communicating with the world, as well as what passes for my, my legacy in this life, it, it seems like the appropriate place to, to celebrate, or commemorate, or commiserate, or, or what have you. Of course, my wife may surprise me with some sort of gigantic Zoom get-together of all my friends this evening, but I'm betting we'll just settle in for a nice dinner and mark another night of, of riding out the pandemic together. Now, 50 does not mean a lot to me. I am not the midlife sort of guy. George Orwell's one of my, my touchstone figures or, or literary influences or whatever you want to call it. But in his final journal entry, Orwell wrote, at 50, everyone has the face he deserves. But yeah, he died at 47. So yeah, what does he know? Now, I first saw that movie, Another Woman, uh, when I was around 18. It introduced me to Rilke and Eric Satie. Klimt also gets featured, but I've been introduced to his work through the, the comics of Bill Sienkiewicz in my teens. It's, um, it's one of Woody Allen's Bergman-esque dramas, and the, the cinematographer is Sven Nickvist, who shot a number of Bergman's movies and is regarded as one of the greatest cinematographers ever. There's a documentary about Nickvist called Light Keeps Me Company, and it was shot by his son in, in Sven's later days after he was diagnosed with aphasia a few years before his death. Now, per Wikipedia, aphasia is, quote, an inability to comprehend or formulate language because of damage to specific brain regions. And that can be due to a stroke, brain injury, neurodegenerative disease, or, or other causes. I am uh, I'm terrified of losing language. It's already um, very difficult to make myself understood sometimes. And when I write, I, I find myself pairing everything away from draft to draft or you know, even looking back on a sentence by the time I finish it, all just trying to keep signal and, and lose all the noise. But at 50, I could see life's not like that. The noise, the noise is just as important as a signal. In, in some ways, it noises our style, the marker of, of who we are and, 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 and how we are. This, I will note, is going pretty far afield of a 50th birthday celebration, but I'm <laughs> not much fun at parties anyway. Um, another woman also introduced me to the great writer Bruce J. Friedman, although I didn't know it at the time. He was just this guy in the movie with a couple of scenes. But later on, my, my best friend, Tom Spurgeon would, would give me a copy of Bruce's nonfiction collection, Even the Rhinos Were Nymphos, and that got me into to Bruce's work. So of the, the two scenes that he's in, um, he manages to steal a scene from Ian Holm, which is no mean feat, and Bruce was not a veteran actor by any means. He was one of the first Pantheon-level guests I ever recorded with. It was 2014 when we got together, the, the same week I quit my job and, and launched myself into this new life that I have. And last June, I was recording a COVID check-in with Bruce's youngest son, Kip, and, and well, he gave me the awful news. Um, I should tell you, uh, Gil, before we start, that I'm doing this interview with a slight heavy heart because uh, my father passed this morning. Oh no! Yeah, that was... so uh, yeah, I'm so it's sorry. not a surprise. I've been saying goodbye no. to him for twelve years, and uh, 
honored every moment I saw him. So uh, he just turned 90 yeah. a month ago. Oh. Still, yeah. you know, it's a bit of a hit, but uh, I felt that I should plow on. I know he would. I was lucky to, to get to record with Bruce, but I also doggedly pursued that with each of his three sons, Drew, then Kip, then Josh Allen, getting me closer to their, their pop. I said all this before. I'll do it again here. I know that I'm incredibly lucky, that I've been blessed with good fortune, no real adversity, no loss in my life until until Tom's death, really. But I've also tried to make the most of the opportunities that I've been given, even though I beat myself up for, for not doing more. So Tom died in November of 2019, uh, about a month before his 51st birthday. Many years ago, we were we were talking about potential and and how committing to one path and not another forecloses on, on all the other selves we could have been. And it stemmed from this passage of Hegel that I've been ruminating on since I read it at like 23 back at St. John's, more than half my life ago now. Anyway, Tom said it reminded him of an interview he'd read with Tommy Lee Jones. Jones was asked when he'd gotten serious about acting, and he said it was when he realized he'd never be the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And the interviewer asked how old he was when he had that realization. And Tommy Lee Jones answered, 40. I think about Tom every day, and I try to live up both to his example and, and to his vision of who I could be. Now, lately, and I, I don't think it's tied to closing in on 50, uh, because like the narrator in Another Woman, I choose not to delve, which might sound weird to those of you who think I am this uh, monstrously self-reflecting, introspective, uh, okay, um, narcissistic figure. But um, I don't actually look too deep. That's that's a secret um, that I shouldn't be telling you right now. But if I really looked inside, it would be awful. Anyway, um, the thing I've been wondering about, the thing that really struck me, especially around the new year, was who we were before the pandemic and and how we've changed. And I wanted to ask people to tell me what they regret not doing before the pandemic hit. And so I did that. And that's going to be the bulk of this episode. And we'll get to their responses, about three dozen people, uh, once I'm done rambling here, I, I promise. For my part, though, I racked my brain over that question. That's why I wanted to hear other people's takes on it, because I can't really think of things that I should have done before this whole situation began. You know, even when 2020 started, I was I was trying to take the opportunities that my life presented. You know, my my incredibly sedate and boring version of YOLO. Like in January last year, I attended the memorial service for Harold Bloom, the the scholar and writer up at Yale. Um I recorded a pair of podcasts early that morning in Jersey City with Richard Cadry and Cassandra Caw, and it was threatening snow, but I drove up to New Haven anyway. They were going to use a little piece of my podcast with Bloom as part of the memorial program, and, you know, that made me believe I deserved a seat in the chapel. Now, when the event finished, we discovered the snow had been coming down hard for at least an hour, and I could have headed back right away, but I decided to attend the reception over at the Beinecke Library instead. I had some nice conversations there, caught up with some past guests, made some new pals. Um, I also briefly met Bloom's developmentally disabled son, whom I'd only learned about a few months earlier in the obits. And after all that, I had a three-plus-hour drive home. Well, closer to four hours, really, to cover 80, 85 miles in absolutely awful conditions. It was exhausting. Um, this long run on Route 95 where I really had to gauge the um, how good the drivers were ahead and behind me. Um, but I made it back, and I let my no my wife know I was alive every half hour or so by voice text. Uh, got in that night. She She'd have preferred that I... Just found a hotel and stayed somewhere overnight, but uh, but I'm a proponent of inertia, I guess. 
Now, my point, and God knows I'm, I'm always struggling to find one, is that I took the opportunity because that, that moment wasn't going to come around again. And it's just like taking the opportunity to reach out to Bloom in the first place to record and, and then to jump at the car and get to New Haven on two hours notice to record with him uh, back in, well, God, on my 45th birthday uh, in 2016. I, I, it was the same morning we found out that Bowie had died and I checked in to see where we were on recording. And he's like, I thought we we're recording today. You'll have to be here at noon. And boom, I was gone. So, so looking at my pre pandemic life or this moment of turning 50, it doesn't make me wonder what happened or, or how I ended up here. You know, like the the once in a lifetime talking heads thing. I don't wonder what I should have done with my life or or take stock or anything. I don't have a lot of regrets the more I think about it. There are people I hurt, women I hurt, and I wish I could fix that, but it's too late. Um, trying to fix it would only cause more pain. There are people I wish I'd pitched a podcast to. I never seriously pursued Philip Roth, and that'll haunt me. I let David Byrne wait until our flight landed, by which point they shuffled him off the plane really quickly, and I never got the chance. I took a no from Donald Hall, the poet and essayist, but later learned from our mutual friend Sven Burkertz that he could have nudged him into a yes. I wish I'd taken up running earlier, but I'm doing the best I can with it now, and maybe if I had started earlier, I'd have more ankle or knee damage than I already do, and... Maybe it's for the best that I started in God, 2018, between 47 and 48 years old. I wish I wrote more, but you guys have heard that for years. That's not a regret. That's, that's my not being the quarterback of the Cowboys. There's more places I want to see, but I've gotten to travel the world right up until a few weeks before the pandemic got out of control. I've lived in the same house almost my entire life, but but I've gone everywhere. And people have shared their stories with me, and it, not just through the podcast, although that's been the biggest boon of my life, uh, meeting so many people through the, the show. But it'll sound weird, but one of the most beautiful moments I can remember came during my last business trip uh, in, in Japan last February. The pandemic was already, well, it was an epidemic at that point. We didn't know it was global, but... We were worried, but we went, and on the, the last day, well, one of the last days there, the president of the company that flew us out there, he told me and Amy the story of his father's funeral, and his American employee translated for us, but but she was new to the company, and, and she didn't know the story. She'd only been there a week or two and, you know, wanted to... to it was still finding her way. So she was processing the story, both as language and as emotion, and, and she started to cry because she was telling us about Kazunori and his father and, and their shared love of country and Western music and, and that old piece of Americana and how Kazu sang a country song at his dad's funeral. It's this breach of cultural etiquette in Japan, but but a sign of their love. I'm doing a lot of talking about fathers and sons and death, I, I see, which probably means, yes, Gil, you do have some regrets, um, or at least there's some stuff I should address. Uh, last episode or, or in the email I sent out or whatever, I mentioned some personal stuff going on. What that was, um, on December 30th, I had to take my father to the ER. He's in poor health, has been for years, and, and he's been weakening for the last couple of months, and, and his, his wife has been worried. And his doctor wanted him admitted, so I picked him up uh, that Wednesday, got him to the hospital. And um, we didn't really talk on the, the drive there. He sat in the back seat, which is our, our COVID protocol for the three times now that we've seen each other since, uh, since this all began. Um, he just looked out the window, and I drove maybe as 10 and too careful and tense as I did a year ago in the snow on the way home from New Haven, even though the weather this time was nice and clear. I think we both knew this could be the last time we, we see each other. 
but still, you know, we'd gotten to this point without being honest. So, you know, what was another couple minutes? And at the intake, uh, when they got his initial info and were about to wheel him to a, a private room for triage, I patted his shoulder and told him he'd be okay. It turns out I wasn't lying. They uh, they discovered a blockage in his liver. They fixed that with a procedure on uh, New Year's Eve the next day, and I sprung him Saturday, two days after that. Um, we didn't talk much on the drive home either, but he's doing okay now. To get back to another woman, um, the movie, it mentions two poems by Rilke. One is The Panther, which it just alludes to. The other is archaic torso of Apollo, for which Marion, the narrator, recites the closing couplet, For here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. But even trundling through my own labyrinth here and, and rambling on like this, I can't come up with much I would change. I found the love of a wonderful woman and we'll be celebrating our, our 15th wedding anniversary in two months. We've, we've kept each other together, kept each other sane, shared our lives and our love for 17 years, a third of my life. And um, that's, that's what sustains. Love is what remains, I guess. At the end of the movie... As Marion starts rebuilding her life, she she asks a question that I've, I've used as the mission statement for the podcast in a weird, elusive way. She wonders if a memory is something you have or something you've lost. So, um, all of that said, I don't know what to make of it either, but I'm 50 years old. I don't feel like there's a lot I would change about my life. But I asked... People, past guests, as well as friends of the show, listeners, people on our Patreon, everything, to call a Google voice number and answer the question, what do you wish you had done before the pandemic? And about three dozen people took me up on it as a combo 2021 kickoff and 50th birthday present to me. Now, as caveats go, uh, some people recorded their own segments uh, different people's phone quality is up and down, so the audio varies throughout. I did my best to process it. Google Voice does not record these super high-res messages. Uh, some people don't introduce themselves, so I take care of that for them. And Google Voice only allows three minutes per message, so a couple of people went over and, and had to call back. So I either stitched those together so you can't tell, or I kept the, sorry, I went too long, as appropriate. So... I am about to listen through all these for the first time because they've been coming in up through up through right now. Uh, so maybe I will have some thoughts on regrets by the time we get to the end of this episode. I'll see you there. Hi, Gail. This is Vital Ripchensky. It's a good question. I'm not sure that I have a good answer. My wife and I always tell each other at certain moments, no shouldas. And that's my answer. I don't like to look back. I don't think anything is gained by doing that. So, no shouldas. Hi, this is Kathy Koja. What I wish I had done before the pandemic struck was understand how much stamina would be required in the months ahead. I understood the election would take some heavy lifting. I did not understand the conjunction of illness inside and out in our country. I wish I had worked to develop a measure of stamina that could have been usefully shared. It is a wake-up call, and I won't get caught short again. Thank you for this question. Thanks for the email, Gil, and for the great question. This is John Hall, host of the Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast and a book that carries the same title. 
I'd already worked from home pre-pandemic, so there wasn't much of a need for a makeshift office setup. But to get out of the house and to see the world in the before times, as you call them, there were days when I'd nip down to the pub on lunch with no plans of returning to my desk in a timely manner. There's something alluring about unscheduled day drinking, sitting quietly in an empty place that will soon be bustling when the working day is done for others. But in the mid-afternoon, there's just yourself with a book or paper, a few others, a bartender, and a pint of beer. I miss in-person interactions, of course, but I miss proper pints of beer. So what do I wish I had done before the pandemic? Install a draft system at home. I already had the at-home bar and plenty of canned and bottled beer offerings, but I missed the pull of a handle, the slow pour into a glass, watching freshly released carbonation emerge, rise, and pop. And alas, when I sought to remedy this, like so many other at-home luxuries, draft systems were on back order. But maybe that's for the best. The hospitality industry is under assault, being dealt near fatal blows each week, and draft beer sales these days are in the pits. So when a vaccine comes and I can get back out there again, I'm already planning on in-person visits, not just for the beer, but to help keep local haunts alive. And that at-home system I would have bought would just gather dust. Here's a cheers to 2021. Hey, Gail, this is Emily Flake. Um, what do I wish I had done before the pandemic struck? To be honest, is it isn't like there's – a restaurant I wish I had gone to or a place I wish I had seen, I am perhaps foolishly optimistic that some of those things will still be there um, when this is over. There are places that are closed that I mourn, that I'm sad that I didn't um, go to or didn't cherish. Um, I, I wish that I had paid more attention and cherished things more. Um, for the most part, to be honest, I just, I wish I had gotten my shit together um, in a little bit more of a realistic way before the pandemic struck. Um, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had made myself into a better grown up um, before uh, things went so spectacularly haywire. But yeah, that is not a very romantic uh, answer, but it is an accurate one. All right, be well. Hello, Wallace Wilde Minolti from Parma, Italy. I'm here in lockdown. I've been here since January 2020 when we returned from New York City. Mother Tongue was reissued by Farrar Strauss in March, and Silence and Silences will be published by them in the fall. Meanwhile, here are my thoughts on what I wish I had done before the pandemic. I wish I'd stopped more then, Stop peering into a future and simply listen more to all that I took for granted. People above all, the trees, the wind, the sea, and suffering and injustice. And stop much more simply to have lived that time more actively. By active, I don't mean running and getting on planes and marching. I mean having been more modestly conscious of possibility the possibility that comes from an exploration of every day. It looks as if I hardly ever stopped to be grateful for a walk in a park or a kiss or picking up a granddaughter and listening to the amazing lift and laughter. It seems as if I never realized how much concentration I had to give to writing and to a voice that would be able to join other voices in delineating realities that need to be seen. It seems I never really gave a thought to what it means not to have choices, as if I read Anna Frank's diary about hiding and being shut in and never thought really about what it means to be shut in and shut down and hiding to save your life. I thought, of course, that I did acknowledge all these things, but it was only in having many of them suddenly withdrawn that I saw I never realized them, in the way we see the ocean floor and what it holds, only in that period when the tide withdraws. I thought a lot about how I never really thought about my own breathing, not with a knee on my neck, not in pollution so bad, masks were required. 
not with an oxygen tube down my throat in order to stay alive. And now that I wear a mask to protect others and myself against the virus, thinking how the word still has a meaning of free and necessary to life. Now I look back and see masks I wore then, little masks, nothing covering, even necessary sometimes, but now I wonder how unaware I was of what was needed to protect ourselves, but also to protect others. Of course, I can't go back, but I see lots of openings in what waits now to be done. Hi, this is Ian Kelly, longtime Virtual Memories pal and past guest. My short answer to this question is that I wish I had been doing things I've since made habits during the pandemic. I had the good fortune to have been able to travel, recreate, and eat well before the pandemic got into full swing. Prior to a couple of weeks ago, I would probably have answered this question by saying that I was fairly well caught up on things the pandemic made impossible and that I didn't have any specific regrets. A couple of weeks ago, over coffee, a friend pointed out that the limitations created by the pandemic have made us appreciate what we do have and to strengthen our connections to the people we care about the most, among other things. This is a revelation to me, and I now wish that before the pandemic hit, I was staying in frequent contact with family, simplifying my life, frequently appreciating my good fortune, and taking nothing for granted. Thanks, Gil. Hi, Gil. This is David Townsend, your old tutor. I wish I had developed more fully a curriculum enabling Americans to think about the beautiful, the good, and the true. These ultimate goals arising from the spirit of great books and great ideas and great conversation will lift our hearts and voices out of the depths of despond and despair and fear. And if we fail to take up this mission, I think we shall sacrifice our children to the worshipers of Moloch and need only three books to grasp what has happened to us, Machiavelli, Alice in Wonderland, and the Marquis de Sade. Thanks, Gil. Hi, Gil. John Bertinoli, and I just wanted to give you a quick answer to the question on which what I would have done. Now, honestly, this seems like a very small thing, but I really wish I would have watched um, the Andromeda Strain again. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners of the podcast are familiar with that movie, the 1971, directed by Robert Wise from the book by Michael Crichton that talked about a virus that came from space. And on a personal level, that movie both terrified me as a child, but it also inspired me because it's one of the things that I saw that really made me want to become a scientist and particularly a chemist. And then in later years, I would watch it every couple of years just to go back to to see what it was about and to marvel at what an amazing job the filmmakers did in creating absolute authenticity in the way they did the science in the movie. So it was always a big deal to me. But to be perfectly honest, now, post-pandemic, I tried to go back and watch it, and it just doesn't have the same level of interest anymore, having, you know, lived through uh, a virus descending and seeing what it's done to people in the community, and it just it just doesn't resonate the same way it used to. So something I wish I would have um, experienced and, and done before it kind of became distasteful to me. Anyhow, happy birthday to you, Gil. Uh, we appreciate the podcast, and we appreciate you. Have a good one. Hi, Gil. It's Jennifer Hayden, and uh, I'm – the cartoonist and the author and artist of the story of my tits and underwire and I've got a couple more books in the works and ever since I've been in my uh, adulthood I would say I have been very disciplined and I have done a lot of work slowly but steadily and uh, as a kid I was uh, very in the clouds and always dreamy and um, running around and procrastinating and never getting anything done. So it's been a lot to me to be disciplined as a grown-up. And I, I just I had to respond to this question of yours because what was so horrific about the, uh, the quarantine for me, and uh, at the same time humorous, I have to add, was that 
I had finally realized how badly I needed to socialize and how much I needed to get out of the house. And we had moved um, five years ago to a new place, not very far away from our old place, but it's a constant reminder. I don't know my neighbors, and I need to um, get to know them and have them, uh, you know, in my life and in my backyard. And I had just become a real recluse. I was an empty nester. Uh, my husband and I both just did our artwork, and that's what we did. And uh, so I had made uh, actually a, a small book with names in it of people that I wanted to invite over and have dinner with and and see on my deck and um, connect with really people that I thought were really interesting, but they're very busy people, and I had to um, – you know, uh, coordinate things carefully to get them over. And then I thought maybe I'll even get some invitations and I'll get out of here and I'll be on someone else's deck. And at the same time, I had made it a priority to start traveling more for um, uh, the in-person part of the work that I do. I wanted to do more presentations and more live discussions with people because I love sharing my books and sharing my thoughts about cartoons, the cartooning and uh, doing graphic novels with other people and uh, go visit more uh, with more students and all of this. And these were my, these were my resolutions in 2019, in January of 2019. I thought this is what I really need to be doing. And, uh, and uh, no, 2020, sorry. It was uh, the, obviously those are my 2020 resolutions. Um, though I think I'd also had them in 2019. And then, boom, uh, none of that got to happen. I had three really uh, sort of awkward visits with people I didn't know too well um, outdoors while you could still do that and feel so much. So Hi, Gail. It's Jennifer Hayden again. I didn't keep it under three minutes, so here's my conclusion. I truly wish before the pandemic struck that I had done more socializing and more traveling. And as a creative person, it's hard to remember how important that is. But after quarantine, I will never forget. And it will always be, um, it will always be something that I relish much more than I used to because it was taken away from me. And I hope that I will get another chance. Happy New Year. Hope things improve. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Richard Cadre. What I really wish I'd done more before the pandemic hit was travel. Uh, I was lucky enough to leave the country briefly before the pandemic hit, and I came home just before everything went to hell. So I got lucky there. I had a little travel, but not nearly enough. I even miss airports and the terrible meals you find in food courts there. I miss book tours, which is a ludicrous type of travel. Even a short tour shows you why rock stars go mad. After a few days on the road, you forget what city you're in, and the world collapses into this, into getting up, getting on a plane, checking into a hotel, doing an event, and then doing it all again the next day. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not complaining. I miss the disembodied movement. The touring inevitably becomes... I hope I get to do it again in 2021. 20, I just want to have the option of leaving one place and flying to another place, or even taking a train, sitting with a bunch of people in an enclosed space for hours and hours at a time, or even, even a day or so. I really look forward to that. I would have also been more careful to see friends more often. Before... It was so easy to duck out on parties and reschedule dinner dates. Now we can Zoom any time we like, but it's not a substitute for anything. My resolutions for 2021 are more travel and more friend time. I can't think of anything better. First happy 50th birthday. Joan Marin's Dim here. Uh, what do I wish that I did before the pandemic? few simple things. I wish that I had had a lot more family dinners. 
uh, with my daughter, her family, and my partner's family. I wish I had gone to Carnegie Hall a few more times for sure. But apart from that, I think what I'd like to just say what I really found out about myself during the pandemic, because we sheltered together, my partner and I, and we made this really wonderful discovery that we were actually very, very compatible and we really loved each other and we really had a wonderful time. We made great meals uh, and, and, uh, and many warm and interesting moments. So there was a good part to the shelter, and I did do some writing, and uh, I don't know if it's good or not, but it was fun doing it at that point. Um, the other revelation, of course, which I think is important to uh, to say, is is that I think we were really, we really are the lucky ones. Our main job was to stay inside, wear a mask on the few times we went out, and come back as quickly as possible. We never wanted for very much. So, all in all, compared to so many others, I feel very lucky. And it makes me wonder, post-pandemic, what I can do for others besides give money away that will be meaningful. Hi, Gail. This is Liniers, author of Macanudo, Daily Strip. Uh, you made me think. Let's see. Um, I guess what I would have liked to have done more in the year 2019 would have been the, you know, the casual friendly contact that we have been robbed of. So just, you know, hugging people and, you know, kissing them hello, kissing them goodbye. Uh, I mean, I'm in from Argentina, so everybody kisses and hugs, which I don't know what will happen in the future if that will still be the thing. <laughs> But I kind of miss that. I think this is the year with less hugs and kisses in the history of of our lives. And most definitely, yeah, uh, it, it's been a, a year of no human contact. And I don't know that that is making us better or worse. So I would have done more of, of that, you know? I haven't hugged and kissed my parents in the last year or my my you know a lot of my friends so i miss that i hope after this happens there'll be a lot a lot of <laughs> of contact stay well man this one is by sven burkertz hello gil um this is sven and i'm here to try to answer your question about what I wish I had done um, before the arrival of the pandemic. And really, there's nothing I can think of for about doing. What I wish I had known, that's another thing. I suppose I had allowed too large a scope for decency and fellow feeling in our elected officials and far too much spine in those who are there to guard our systems and make sure they work, and put too much faith in the supposed American virtue of common sense. At the same time, I wish I had understood that there are those who embody these same qualities along with kindness at levels far greater than I had unthinkingly supposed. I wish I had known to better brace myself with a persistent disquiet unknowable outcomes could create. I wish I had known how large a capacity I had for reflection and solitary action and how much worry I could have for the people close to me. Do I wish all these things? Would they have eased these months? 
I don't know. I suppose in a larger sense, we can always look back at ourselves and wish we had done or known more. Happy 2021. Hi, this is Barbara Nessam. Actually, the pandemic afforded me time to complete 14 oil paintings for my upcoming show at the Mallon Gallery here in New York. Everything slowed down to a pace where it allowed me time, T-I-M-E, for considered thinking and rethinking the future. I am sorry for all the loss of lives that families have endured. There is where the tragedy lies. Hi, Gail. This is David Leopold. You've had me on to talk about Al Hirschfeld and all kinds of things. I love the show, and I'm happy to answer the question, what do I wish I had done before the pandemic? And uh, unfortunately for you, I can't tell you much. Uh, sure, I wish I would have learned to play a musical instrument, paint a picture, be a better gardener, any one of those things. Um, but that's going to be true after the pandemic as well. Um, I don't expect to be a great musician, a great painter, and although I do hope to be a better gardener, and certainly the pandemic has helped that. Um, I try to live my life, uh, carpe diem is a real thing for me, and uh, I try to live my life that way. Um, over the pandemic, I uh, uh, edited a collection of uh, stories by a painter uh, by the name of Robert Beck, who I'm organizing a retrospective of his work uh, for the James A. Michener Art Museum in Bucks County, Pennsylvania for next August. And he has been writing a monthly column uh, for the last 15 years for uh, a regional magazine. And in one of the stories, he is uh, in Africa and uh, he's never been there before, feels completely uncomfortable. He's there with a bunch of doctors. He's part of a whole situation where they're raising money uh, for the doctors to do more work. And uh, they're in the middle of nowhere. He sees a little village and he realizes this is what he wants to paint. And uh, despite the fact that he does not know the language or... Um, really doesn't know anything about the place. He has to be let off there, even though he knows they won't be back for him for the whole day. They're going to be actually doing operations and they won't be back for him till the evening. And uh, everyone's like, what do you mean? You know, how could you be doing this? And he gets out. And uh, as he gets out, one of the guys in the uh, in, in the Jeep uh, talks about regret minimization. And I think that's a big part of what he does. And I think I share that with him. Um, you know, I have another friend who's a painter, uh, Giovanni Cassidy, who told me one time that if he got hit by a car, he would be upset about the paintings he didn't get to paint. Um, but uh, as for looking at his life of things he should have done or could have done, he wouldn't have those because he was doing what he wanted to do. And I guess I'm that way as well. Um, uh, the pandemic has been a wonderful time to catch up on episodes of your show, and it's introduced me to a lot of uh, great people and a lot of great art, which I'm greatly appreciative of, and I look forward to listening to more, and I look forward to getting past the pandemic. Happy New Year, everybody, and uh, we will see you when we do. Bye-bye. Hi, Gil. This is Tess Lewis. The Virtual Memory Show will always be associated in a very direct way uh, with the pandemic for me since the podcast that you recorded was one of the last interpersonal things I did before shutdown. So I think of it as before time. What I wish I had done before the pandemic, well, actually there are a lot of things, but the two things I wish I'd done most is taken my friend up on her invitation to go see the Northern Lights. We were going to go up to in north of Sweden, but I put it off. There had been a volcanic explosion. The sightings weren't meant to be that great. But I think seeing, having a memory of those Arctic lights would have um, brightened up this long stretch of the pandemic. The second thing I'd wish I'd done is gone and taught a master class at the Siegel Book School of Publishing in Calcutta. Uh, that was another thing I thought, oh, I'll do it later, but now later is stretching on and on, and who knows what the aftertimes will bring. So thanks very much for your pandemic uh, episodes in the podcast. Uh, they've been something to look forward to, 
And I'm also looking forward to the post-pandemic episode. Be well. Bye-bye. Ken Krimstein here. Uh, I've had a lot of time to think about it. What would I have done in the before times? And I'm sitting here looking at our dining room table with eight chairs around it, eight empty chairs. And my wife and I had been thinking about, oh, we'd love to have these two people and these two people and this person come over and, you know, we'll have some cocktails and make some food and get people around the table and just talk into the night and listen to some records and just have a great time and mix up people and the table is just sitting there empty waiting for a non-Zoom cocktail, chow, conversation. Yeah, that would be great. That's what I miss. Should have done it. Would have done it. Will do it. Anyways, best wishes and thanks, Gil. Uh, hi, virtual memory listeners. This is Michael Shaw, cartoonist and co-author of the beloved, at least by me, book, The Elements of Stress and the Pursuit of Happy-ish. Ironically, the one thing I wish I would have done before the pandemic is listen to more podcasts. I had a 40-minute one-way commute to work, and I was not using it incredibly productively. You know, I was thinking I was going to learn French, but men no. And uh, once the pandemic struck, I had no more commute. And then, but I got the book written, and I got introduced to the word world of the podcast through Bill. So now my question is, if you don't have a commute, when do you listen to a podcast? Because it's hard for me to listen to things and do other things, but I feel like with except driving. So I want to thank Gil for introducing me to the podcast universe, and I had no idea it was so vast and varied. And once the pandemic, pandemic's over, and if I'm ever, ever forced to commute again, I will pick up that hobby or pursuit. All right. Have a great 2021. Bye-bye. This is Dimitri Samrov. Try to keep it brief. Um, I think the, uh, the main thing uh, that I would do uh, where there's a lockdown um, would be the things that I would do in any other year. Uh, the, thing, the thing I miss most week to week, I think, is making a playlist for the bar to play on Sundays. Uh, since I haven't been bartending, and the bar's been closed. I miss uh, sharing music uh, with the people that come in uh, to drink. Uh, I'm still searching out the music and listening to it myself, but uh, sitting here alone, uh, there's no one to share it with. I, I had a couple of trips planned, um, one for my uh, parents' 50th uh, wedding anniversary to Florence, which obviously can't be rescheduled. The other was to visit uh, the new MoMA, uh, which I hope still to do at some point, uh, but maybe not uh, via plane. Uh, I can't really imagine sitting on a plane at this point, and if I never have to get on one again, I don't think I'd uh, shed any tears. I think that about covers it. Hi, this is Maria Alexander. I'm the author of the award-winning books, Mr. Wicker, Snowed, and I write also under the pseudonym of Quentin Banks. Um, wow. I wish I had seen my disabled sister again. Um, she lives in Northern California. I live in Southern California. Uh, and she has a severe brain injury. She understands that there's a pandemic. She has great caregivers, but she really gets lonely and really wants to see us and I really want to see her. The other thing I wish I had done before the pandemic is I wish that I had learned CPR and other basic first aid skills. Now my husband's an Eagle Scout. He says, oh, I know all those things. You don't need to know all those things, but I, I disagree. I, I really need to know those things because we can't just go to the hospital or go to the doctor whenever we want. 
now. It's really, uh, <clears throat> it's really dangerous. So I wish I had learned some basic skills in uh, self care and what to do in an emergency. That's really it. Thanks, Gail. Thanks for this opportunity, and I wish everyone to be safe, healthy, and happy. Thank you. Hey, Gil, Paul Toomey here. It's <laughs> it's kind of funny to be sending you my regrets as birthday wishes, but <laughs> it also seems very appropriate to the times in which we wade through, like souls wading through a river of molasses. And uh, it's my pleasure to do it. So the thing that I regret the most uh, and feel very keenly is not not keeping connections alive with friends and people I love. You see, I was writing a book uh, and finished it just before the pandemic hit. The creation of that book took several years. And uh, you, you know the book. It's Screwball, the cartoonist who made the funnies funny. I appeared on your show to talk about it. Thank you very much. And I, you know, you know I'm a family man and, and work a full-time job and only had a little bit of spare time. And I devoted every precious minute of that spare time to researching and writing and creating this book. And this went on for years. And during that time, I, <laughs> I encouraged or I indulged my introvert tendencies and just holed up and didn't have a social life, pretty much. And then it hit me. Uh, I think it was around this time of year in 2018. A friend of mine, a wonderful, wonderful, witty Seattle cartoonist and writer named Mark Campos, C-A-M-P-O-S, took his life. And it just, it just wrenched at me. I didn't know Mark that well. And uh, I wanted to get to know him better. And it just hit me really hard. It was really surprising how hard it hit. And in a way, in, in an effort as as a way of dealing with it and trying to heal my the the pain that I was feeling at his shocking decision to take his life, I wrote a long retrospective of his life. I quickly researched his life and his work and wrote a retrospective piece about him and and about what had happened uh, somewhat. Uh, and, and it's published uh, in the online version of the Comics Journal. It's still there. It's free. It can be found by Googling Comics Journal and Mark Campos. And it includes samples of his work, uh, which I think you would have really enjoyed talking with Mark Gill. Uh, he was such a funny guy and such a wit and such a just a warm, authentic person. And a lot of people felt this huge loss. It made me realize when you get to the last square on the game board, you, you're you going to probably think the most important thing was the connections you made with people. And that's certainly true for me anyway. And I had let a lot of connections uh, dwindle and grow very, very cold. Even though I still held these people in my heart and in my thoughts, I realized I, that once I finished my book, the next big project, capital B, capital P, in my life was not going to be another book just yet, but reconnecting. And so I was making plans to travel and go see friends and family and uh, as well as reconnect with a lot of my friends in the Seattle area, which is where I live. And then, let's see, my book came out in October of 2019, and there were two or three months of uh, still spending my time promoting it and 
doing presentations and uh, I appeared on your show. That's where I got to meet you. In fact, and actually, you know, I, I should say that writing a book is while, you know, writing can be a very lonely, self-isolating experience. You're at least in my case, you're also doing it to to connect with people, to reach out to the world, to put your to put something you love out there for other people to love. And that's a way of connecting as well. And and it has brought back to me a, a, a wonderful warmth uh, from people, you know, writing me and telling me they love the book. It was nominated for an Eisner Award. Unfortunately, <laughs> there was no Eisner ceremonies held live this year at the Comic-Con. The Comic-Con didn't happen. And uh, so I... You know, that was another plan was to go to Comic-Con for the first time in my life. I've always wanted to go and I would have been there sort of, quote unquote, legitimately as a as an author. But that didn't happen. Uh, but that's not really something that I regret. Uh, but I'm sad that it happened. But the point being a book is a way of connecting with people and it connected me with you. I got to meet you and. And in fact, your show, I think, is is about connecting with people. And I think that's why I like it so much. Anyway, my book came out in October and I spent a few months promoting it. And then I began to make plans and then the pandemic hit and the lockdown started. And I just didn't feel it was safe or responsible to get on a plane and or to spend time you know, face to face with people. And I've just continued to be very isolated as have many of us. And so, man, I sure wish that I had taken some time off from writing and, and spent it with friends. And when this pandemic lifts, I am not going to ne neglect that again. I promise you that. So happy birthday, Gil. The big five O, you know, Groucho Marx said time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana. I leave you with that thought until the next time we meet. Thank you. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye. This is Kyle Cassidy, a photographer from Philadelphia. And I've thought a lot in the last 10 months about, you know, the before times and the now times. And I'm actually hard-pressed to think of something that I wish that I had done that I hadn't. And that's not to say that there are things that I haven't, I haven't done that I would like to have done. But I think that I am in a position where I was well-prepared for the things that happened. And that doesn't mean that I had been planning and stockpiling uh, dried beans in my basement. But I think that... Um, I'm fortunate enough to be in a place where the pandemic hasn't affected me in the way that it's affected a lot of other people. And it seems that it would be petty for me to make any complaints about how things are going for me when I've spent a lot of time during the pandemic talking to other people whose lives have been catastrophically changed by this. I've spent a lot of time photographing uh, doctors and nurses, healthcare workers, and uh, first responders, and people whose lives are inarrestably altered because of this in, in traumatic ways. And the effect on my life has been, in comparison, so minimal. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live in a relatively large house with a partner who I love, and the, our working spaces are large enough and far enough and, and, and far enough apart from each other that if we don't want to see each other throughout the day, we don't have to. Um, we have a backyard, which has been useful for um, spending time with friends who can stay 20 feet away from us, uh, you know, while we talk. Um, we do have skills that have been helpful to us. Um, I have been 
working with healthcare professionals to develop COVID-19 training materials. Um, my wife has been working also with in the with healthcare professionals um, doing training things. And you know, I realize when I wake up every morning that m my life is uh, comfortable and protected, even though our, our, you know, our lifestyle has been turned upside down um, compared to everybody else, compared to well, so many other people. And so I think there's nothing that I can conceivably say. Hi, Gil. This is Henry Wessels calling from Montclair, New Jersey. I wish that I had learned to draw before the pandemic or to play a musical instrument with some degree of competence as a way of interacting with the world in a different way than my usual way of reacting through the written word. All the best for the new year. Bye. Hi, Gail. It's Warren Woodfin. I spent last year on sabbatical in Washington, D.C., and of course, I wish that I had made more progress on my book project while I was there before libraries and museums shut down. So there are uh, an infinite number of things that I wish I could have done on the research front. But the one discrete thing that I really had planned to do while I was in Washington was to revisit the restaurant Old Europe on Wisconsin Avenue, right behind the Naval Observatory, uh, one that I have indelibly associated with Donald Rumsfeld's remarks about Germany and France, well, back in um, 2002, 2003, I can't remember exactly when uh, Rumsfeld dismissed France and Germany as old Europe, but it's a delightfully frozen and amber German restaurant with caravels hanging from the ceiling and a blind pianist uh, playing uh, lounge music in the background. Uh, I had absolutely planned on going while I was in Washington, and of course, uh, COVID snuck up on us. Uh, but there we are. Uh, we'll see whether that restaurant survives this uh, this year. I'm, I'm uh, not optimistic, I'm afraid. Hope you're well, uh, and I wish you a very happy upcoming birthday. Take care. Hey, Gil, what's up? It's E.S. Glenn here. And I guess my answer to what I wish I had done before the pandemic is I wish I would have kind of investigated a little bit more in how to get a representative to kind of help me out with this movie deal thing that came into my life right before the pandemic. Uh, I got contacted by somebody in Hollywood, I guess like a almost, a, I guess, a headhunter or something like that, who I guess just goes around and checks comic properties to buy. And I really didn't know how to handle it. And I was just like messaging back and forth, uh, planning to buy my house <laughs> and all this stuff and getting really excited. And, you know, the pandemic and personal life all came tumbling down at the exact same time. And I just kind of wish... I had whatever that that skill that people who can sell themselves have um, because I think I'm a good cartoonist and I think I'm a good painter and I think I'm a good storyteller and I can see a lot of comic properties being made into TV shows or somehow people are able to sustain themselves, etc. And I know that there's a like a, a personality type or a, some kind of understanding or calm of, I don't know, but I wish that I would have maybe read rich dad, poor dad or something that would have, I, I wish I would have acquired some kind of knowledge to be able to handle stepping out of the realm of just, um, I guess, unknown, poor uh, artist guy to at least, you know, I can sell my stuff on Etsy, you know, or I can, I can know to have an agent 
to deal with if Hollywood comes knocking at my door to walk away with a paycheck or a movie or a project or something a little bit more than just my amateur style. So that's what I wish I would have done a little bit different before the pandemic or what I wish I would have done before the pandemic, kind of figure it out a way to grasp the situation that I was in. Eh, that's basically it. I hope you have a great new year. I hope your listeners, uh, your listeners have a great new year as well. And I hope I turn this in on time. See you later, Gil. Ciao, brother. This is Philip Bain speaking from Houston, Texas, where I wish I'd managed to complete a few projects I was helping my father, John Bain, with before the pandemic. These include a book with some of his woodcuts, a series of vignettes about growing up in Minnesota in the 1920s and 30s, and a few stories from his service during World War II. We were finalizing some of the details when he had a stroke in November of 2019. After a few weeks, he recovered enough to resume writing, at least for a while. So even after the stroke, there was a small window where I could have done more to move our projects along. Then came the pandemic, and then I was unable to visit him in the nursing facility, and then he took a turn for the worse, and his heart gave out, and he died before we ever finished, last Father's Day at the age of 101. For a few days in early June, I was allowed to see him in the hospital where he was able to sign a mail-in ballot for a Democratic primary runoff. Of course, my biggest regret is that because of the pandemic, I couldn't be there by his side to hold his hand when he passed. For my father, books and life were intertwined, and he would have appreciated what you do. For years, he had a daily ritual that included listening to music, reading poetry, and sipping a cold glass of vermouth before dinner. I hope you'll raise a glass in his memory, and thank you. Our next two guests are Woodrow Phoenix and Ryan Hughes. Gil, it is I, Woodrow. I was waiting for a quiet moment to record this, but there's just not going to be one. You can probably hear the birds tweeting in the background. They are very loud, which, you know, is quite pleasant this time. Anyway, so I was thinking about what I wish I could have done last year, and pretty much what it comes down to is going to visit the town of Ghent in Belgium. Because last year, no, actually two years ago now, because it was October 2019, my girlfriend and I went to Antwerp. She was working. I tagged along, and um, while we were there, we went to the museum Plant in Mauritius. So that's the museum that is dedicated to the work of uh, Nicholas Plantin and Jan Mauritius, who are two incredible printers, and it's a site of pilgrimage for every typographic person in the world because of the incredible things they made in their time. And um, I've been meaning to go there, literally, for the last, like, 25 years, and never got there until last year, and it was incredible. And I felt like an idiot for not having gone there sooner. And we were pretty much just in there all day, looking at all the amazing typographic stuff. Centuries of printing, kinds of books, and two of the oldest printing presses in the world, and stuff like this, which is, you know, the kind of stuff that we like. So we thought, we have to go to Ghent next, because that's the other place where all this stuff survives, with an incredible tradition of printing and type design. And we were going to go in March, because that's when Bridget's birthday was. And we pretty much had it all figured out. And then, since it was mid-March, and we were starting to hear all the stuff about the virus spreading, we thought it would be sensible not to go. So we didn't. And now I wish that we had just gone a lot earlier. But I guess we'll go one day. What do I wish I had done before the pandemic? Um, I normally find myself trying to do too many things. And it's, there's always something that I'm interested in or want to do, and I barely have any downtime at all. So <laughs> I rarely find myself in a position where I'm actually thinking of more things that I should have done. It's more a case of 
I should have slowed down a bit. So this pandemic has in some ways enforced a kind of slowdown, at least in travel plans. But in other ways, it's sort of business as normal in terms of creating and drawing and writing and designing. Uh, but then if you have the kind of job that isn't impacted um, by lockdown because you work in a small studio or you work in such a way that you can carry on regardless, there's not actually a great deal of difference. Um, so yes, my, my, my pandemic and my pre-pandemic um, existence has got a lot in common. Happy birthday, Gil. This is Alta Lynn Price. I very much side with Edith Piaf regarding regrets. I try not to have any, but uh, not but, and really what I would have liked to have done in the before time uh, is to spend more time with friends and family. Not anyone specific to name, but it's really uh, time together is so precious. Phone and video calls are great, but they aren't the same. I wish I had broken bread with more friends more frequently. I hope on that note that you have a delicious birthday cake to enjoy today, and I will see you soon on your podcast. Hi, Gil. This is Durf Back Durf. Um, you know, I don't have any regrets. Uh, ever since I recovered from my last go-round with cancer, which was about 10 years ago. I can honestly say I've lived my life to the fullest. As Warren Zevon so brilliantly said, enjoy every sandwich. And I've done all I can to do just that. Um, just before the lockdown, I had a three-week tour through Europe and, you know, enjoyed that. Uh, as much as I've enjoyed any trip to Europe, and I've, I think I've been to Europe 26 times since my friend Dahmer came out in 2012. So I don't have a lot of regrets. Um, I can't think of one. Uh, I, I regret that the book launch got screwed so badly. I mean, I had a 40 tour book stop, a book tour that went up in flames. Um, all the all those fests, all the people I would have met, all the colleagues I would have hung out with. That I regret. But something I left on the table, nope. Be well. Hey, this is Frank Santoro. Happy birthday, bud. Um, you know, I heard your question, but what I really heard or read uh, was I wish I would have went to Tom Spurgeon's memorial which I didn't go to because it was just too crazy of a time and I was too emotionally overwhelmed and exhausted from traveling too much, <laughs> which seems ridiculous now. Um, so if I would have went, I would have heard your uh, touching uh, memorial speech uh, to, to the audience there, to everybody gathered which I did hear um, later when I uh, watched and listened to the recordings. But um, I missed that. I didn't do that. That was before the pandemic, and that was one of my last uh, real opportunities to see a lot of friends gathered, but I just couldn't handle it at the time. And now <laughs> here I am a year later wishing I could do something very much like that. So anyway, that's what I wanted to do. And happy birthday, bud. See you. Hi. My name is Carol Tyler, and I uh, write and draw comics. I've been thinking about this question from Gil about what do I wish I had done. And the reason why I hesitated till almost the last minute here is that I keep thinking about what I may have missed on my list of things that I really want to do. And... Quite frankly, I can't think of anything. I I don't know if that makes me, I don't know where that puts me. I just think, well, would I need a haircut? Well, no, okay, I'll go with my long hair. Do I miss people? Well, yeah, but, you know, I need to use this time to work at my drawing table. Um, do I wish I had this or that? 
I'll tell you what I miss. I miss, believe it or not, going to the thrift store. I miss seeing my family, although we didn't really, uh, you know, it wasn't a daily thing, so I do miss a few of the the spontaneity of encounters. I really miss going out and seeing my comics friends at these shows. So for me, it's more like, oh, I miss this and that. But in terms of, like, could I have done something else? I really, there's really nothing. I hate to say that, but I guess because I'm already chained to my drawing table, it's like, oh, well, then I better just get back to work. Okay. Best wishes and good health to all. Bye-bye. This is David Mickex, and... I can think of so many things I wish I had done before coronavirus hit us in March, but two things come to mind. The first is, well, I live in Brooklyn, and it's not too far from one of New York's great institutions, the Film Forum, which has constantly wonderful, wonderful movies running in double features, often uh, new movies every day or every other day. Just before mid-March, there was a series of movies selected by Martin Scorsese and Jay Cox. And, uh, you know, I saw one or two of them, and I remember thinking, ah, I have to work. I don't have time for this. Um, I wish I had seen all of them. Uh, I was about to go see The River, Jean Renoir's great film with my mother-in-law in that series. And I thought, oh, I just don't have time. So I wish I'd done that. I wish I'd gone to Sammy's Romanian um, on Christie Street, the famous, uh, I don't know what to call it, but I've heard so many stories about it. Uh, It's so much fun. There is uh, entertainment. There is schmaltz. Well, you know, i got to tell you, the reason I never went there was I'm a pescatarian, and uh, Sammy specializes in meat products as well as vodka. I do drink vodka. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it sounded like so much fun, and now they're closing, although they say they're going to reopen. So those are two of my regrets. I could go on for hours, but I'll stop there. Thanks. Hi, Gil. This is Mike Gerber. Uh, I'm a writer and the publisher of the American Bystander Humor Magazine. Um, I'm loaded with pre-pandemic regrets. I wish I'd gone to Rome before starting this book I'm writing uh, about Julius Caesar. I wish I'd gone to Musso and Frank's, a restaurant here in uh, Hollywood. My neighbor was teaching me piano, and we had to stop after the second lesson. So I've been playing the same three bars of Claire de Lune for uh, almost a year. and <laughs> I'm anxious to learn the rest, I guess. Uh, but you know, it's funny. I don't have a lot of regrets and I don't even really think these, think of these as regrets. They're more sort of reminders, um, of things that I want to do. And in just a general sense, a spur to me to, uh, have more fun in my life. That's a big, uh, as a comedy writer, you might be surprised, but that's, that's a big uh, thing I have to work on. So that's what I'm going to try to do most of all. Thanks for the opportunity. I hope everybody's well. Hello, my name is Boaz Roth. I'm the older, if not elderly, brother of Gil Roth, and here is my response. First, I need to say that as of today, COVID has not impacted the physical health of any of my loved ones, nor has it greatly affected my economic stability. I consider myself lucky on that count and acknowledge that what I'll add here pales beside the experience of those who have lost loved ones, their health, and financial security. I hate to admit it, but Gil's question has me stumped. Pre-pandemic regrets? If we count out making money on the stock market, and I suppose that's a path only traversable by failed Georgia Republican senatorial candidates, the obvious answer would be seeing family one more time. But as the pandemic lingers on, I start to wonder how enriching one more visit here or one more hug there would really help. Chugging a gallon of water has a negligible effect a week later into a desert march. So 
So I think the only way I can answer this question is to single out not what I didn't get enough of, but what I deeply miss now. I really miss Sunday afternoons in the library with my youngest daughter as she finds a quiet, sunlit corner to grab a book and lose herself for an hour. I miss opening up a scorebook in a Burger King as my middle daughter and I mentally replay her basketball game through its statistical afterlife. I miss the visits from my oldest daughter with all the shrieks and laughter from her sisters as she walks into the house. I miss the times walking hand in hand with my wife at a restaurant, a movie theater, or a mall, knowing I'm holding a treasure for the whole world to see. COVID hasn't left me with regrets of the past, but it has denied me the pleasures of the present and has clouded my future. Hi, Gail. This is Walter Bernard. You know, one of the joys of my life before the pandemic was having lunch regularly with Milton Glaser. Over the past 50 years, I must have had over 3,000 lunches with Milton. Milton loved lunch. He never missed a lunch, and he never ate alone. Whether it was just the two of us or with a few or many, he was always amusing, never discussed work, sometimes politics, sometimes jokes, but mostly the mysteries and ironies of life. If we were in a Chinese restaurant, however, he would order for everyone because he was himself a great Chinese cook. In December of 2019, we just published our book, Mad Men, 50 Years of Making Magazines, when Milton became ill, and he was in and out of the hospitals. In February, he rallied and was back home. He was planning a new studio and then a new apartment, but he was quickly quarantined by his doctors so we could only talk by phone. We could not get together. Unfortunately, Milton died on his birthday, June 27, 2020, his 91st year. What I would have liked to have done before the pandemic is have one more lunch with Milton. When I talk about taking opportunities, I want to say that getting to sit down with Milton Glaser for a podcast, which is how I ended up meeting and recording with Walter, was one of the high points of my life. I was nervous about contacting Milton, put it off for a while from fear of getting a no, but I steeled myself after reading this great article about his 90th birthday, and he invited me to the studio for a podcast. So, like I keep saying, don't just take the opportunities, but, you know, make them. You have to ask. Okay, now our final response is from Dean Haspiel and Whitney Matheson. Whitney is one of the last two people I recorded with in person on March 7th, 2020 in in New York. Dino uh, is the person who connected us. And they've managed to have a quarantine pod or bubble or whatever the hell you call it with a few other close pals. I don't have that because I don't trust anyone besides my wife um, and feel that no one else should trust me. But your mileage may vary. Um, Anyway, Dean and Whitney recorded a 22-minute video response to my question on their Nightworks YouTube channel um, with a lot more about the marvels of the mech rib. Uh, I will put a link to that in the show notes for this one, but I edited edited this down to just the directly pertinent stuff. Um, You want to watch the the video, too, because I... I cut it right before they get to talking about the first things they do once we're past this whole situation, which is a very different question than the one that I said to everybody. What do you wish you had done before? Gil Roth, a podcaster. Yeah. Fan of literature and books and graphic novels, posed a question to uh, a, a lot of his past guests and fans and listeners and uh, that question was, what, what, what was it? <laughs> it was, what do you mm-hmm. wish you had done mm-hmm. before the pandemic? I need something to wash down. Um, okay. Yeah, what do you wish you'd done before the pandemic? 
Is that implying though that you knew the pandemic was going to come? Yes. And like with the onset of, of this p- particular pandemic, what would you have done like to prepare for it or it, it's, it, it, you know, in fear of dying or something or well, getting, what do you think it is? No, well, look, one of the things that comes to mind, I think for lots of people is I wish I had, like, I haven't seen my parents mm-hmm. in over a year. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I wish I would have seen people had I known mm-hmm. that I would not see them for well, who knows? Who knows how much longer it's going to mm-hmm. be? Really mm-hmm. long times. I don't. That's a really tricky question. I mean, I could say I wish I'd gotten a bike, but I got a bike mm-hmm. like a couple months after it started. Uh, I could say I wish I'd eaten in restaurants more or something, but I ate in restaurants all the time. You know, like you're talking about all the stuff. That, well, some stuff that you're missing right now. Like go to the movies and the stuff that you would miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did that. You know, it's not like I would do that more. Yeah, and I think I appreciated it while I was doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know. What about you? Well, before we get to me, because I actually don't even really need to think about this, and I have been thinking about it ever since I read Gil's question. And, okay, well, maybe I'll answer a little bit in this way. I feel as a freelance artist, cartoonist, writer, my life hasn't changed that much. Like, I still have been going to the studio, still working all the time. I'm, you know, alone a lot. And... Some of that has to do with the fact that, you know, a lot of our studio mates didn't come back to the studio because of the pandemic and right. not wanting to get infected. And I, I appreciate and get that. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm closer, just like you are, closer to the studio than some of our studio mates. And I was able to bike ride and avoid, you know, people in general and be able to come here and be in a big space, largely alone. Except for when you'd show up and a couple other studio mates eventually. Because at one point, I was in the studio completely alone for months. And it was not that long. It was a couple, at least a couple of months, at least, before people, a couple of people started to trickle back in because of the weather. Yeah, I'm trying to. Because spring showed up and then, you know, summer started to, and then there was, you know, open windows. I was here for a while, but also I was sick, which is why I wasn't here for a while. Mm hmm. Yeah, I wish I'd. Uh, I wish uh, I'd worn a mask for like three months before the pandemic started, so I wouldn't mm. have gotten sick. Mm-hmm. I, I wish I. Oh, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I have a lot of wishes in that respect. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's a it's a a question of like some bucket list type thing, like. Before you die, do you wish you had done something, right? Not necessarily. I mean, I have to believe it's all coming back, don't you? It is coming. It is back. You're talking about the pand- uh, the virus. No, I mean, like, it's pointless to say, like, I wish I'd gone to see, like, Broadway shows. That all Everything's going to come back eventually. Mm. Do you think no? It's going to be a long time? It's either going to be a long time or it's going to come back in a very different way where there'll be less... I guess seats available per show because I think the idea of packing us all in as sardines again, like on the subway in theaters, um, concerts, I don't think that's going to, I don't think people are going to dig that as much, you know, uh, anymore. And it'll be a harder sale. You know, I think we're going to, I think we appreciate space now more than ever. If you can get it, like we live in a big city, so we're all used to being in tin cans and smaller spaces, you know, but a lot of America has a lot of space. So I think in a lot of ways that they're used to having that space and we need to adopt that in our cities in some way so we can function better. And, and, and I've said this before, I'm a cartoonist and I write a lot of fantasy stuff. We need to change the idea of money. Things have gotten too expensive and unwieldy and there's rich and there's poor and not a lot in between, you know, and we need to just sit, change what things cost and the pricing of, of everything. Well, that's what's crazy is that I feel like just even just like if you're talking about food. So I, before all this, I used to go out to eat all the time. I used to, you know, mm-hmm. and I feel like I'm paying even more now for food and I'm home and I'm eating like, you know, like ribs. And I mean, like. How did that happen? Everything. This is pandemic food. Where you I have less money. Yeah, everything 
Yeah. And and then there's a COVID tax. I paid a COVID tax. Oh, that's right. Where was it? At, um, we went out to eat. You don't need to say where it was. I forget where it was, but I was like, wait a second, what? Yeah. And I can't afford that wherever, wherever I go. And yes, a lot of my food during the pandemic, which is an essential thing for everyone so we can all relate, was I did a lot of home cooking. I brought food home to the studio. I indulged a lot of my local um, takeout places and delis and a couple. I didn't really eat in a restaurant. I've eaten maybe in three or four restaurants this entire time. You know, and I mean three or four times. Are you at like outside? Three or four times at best, you know, at a restaurant. Oh, me too. Me too. You know, and so, and I don't go to bars. I mean, again, I'm trying to help out the local businesses as best I can, you know. But, so wait, what's your answer to that question? What do you wish you'd done before the pandemic? You didn't answer it. I wish I'd found a great tutor or Oh, you're a mom. Something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was ill prepared mm-hmm. for that. I still am, you know. Oh, I don't really know the answer to that because I just adapt, you know, so I don't really think in terms of oh, I shoulda, coulda, woulda. I mean, I just relied on my skill sets, what was available around me, and you adapt. That's what I did, and that's what I'm doing. There's no, like, I wish, again, it's not like a bucket list thing where you, like, you know, you have six months left to live. What do you want to do? Um, Sure, we're all a little afraid because people are dying from this uh, or been infected, and, and their lives dramatically changed. And we all know someone who's been impacted by this, or lots of people that have, and in very negative ways and hell negative ways at our own homes. Like, you know, uh, income has changed, <laughs> you know, um, new jobs are difficult to get, you know, as a freelance artist mm-hmm. or writer or whatever. And, and again, it's all about adapting and trying to figure out what to do next. So I don't know. I, it's, it's a, it's, it's a hard question cause it's kind of a broad question. And I, I get that because you know what kind of answer you'll get from that. And and I don't have a very specific answer. I feel like I did appreciate what I had before. All, you know, it's not, I mean. But that's not a changing thing. That's more like a, more of an understanding and of I the feel pandemic. Like I took advantage, like, you know, I did take advantage of living in, in the city. You know, some people might say, like, they wish they'd gone out more. Or they wish they'd, mm-hmm. I don't know, mm-hmm. whatever. But I... Yeah, it's hard for me to come up with anything except um, unless it's related to being prepared mm-hmm. or being, you know, healthier. Uh, <laughs> I meant like, you know, prevent, like, yeah, pre- preventive. Preventative, yeah. prophylactic, well, yeah. <laughs> prophylactic measures. <laughs> yeah, because by the time, like, it was just too late. By the time everybody was like, stay home and wear a mat, you know, all mm-hmm. that for me anyway. And a lot mm-hmm. of people, mm-hmm. you know, certainly a lot of people in New York, and mm-hmm. but everywhere, but especially in New York where we know so many people who got sick, it was just, you know, it was too mm-hmm. late. So. So basically what, in a way, what we're asking is we know there's this second wave that's happening right now, but let's say, you know, a year or two from now, we're kind of quote back to a certain kind of normal that we and where we've learned. But what have we learned from this? And are we a, do we think it's going to happen 100 years again from now or 10 years from now? I guess it's it's preparing us for this happening, a version of this happening again. Yeah. Right. So how would you prepare for the next one? What are you going to add to your household? What are you going to add to your regime, to your daily routine you think now because of this i don't know what i, I can't i don't know more what, batteries what, what more, batteries. more batteries <laughs> right? i mean i have a kid so i always have batteries batteries candles <laughs> and, um, uh, you know wipes and wipes certain, yeah <laughs> i remember uh, watching happy days and I think at one point they were always talking about oh, what was it like? They thought the the, the atom bomb was going to go off, and people had these shelters, mm-hmm. underground shelters, mm-hmm. with like lots of canned food and flashlights and 
you know, was it potted water or something like that? And, you know, ways to survive, you know, that's true. Do you think that might reemerge? I will. Well, I think for, well, for some people, you know, they're doomsday. Survivors who are always yeah. already doing that. But, um, mm-hmm. no, that's one thing. Like I am terrible about that. I was like having like my refrigerator, even when I live, well, even when I had a bigger refrigerator and a bigger house, I have enough food like for the next maybe two days, and then I don't look past that. But now I am better about like having stuff in case we have to mm-hmm. like hunger down for a long time, like we did at first. Mm-hmm. Like at first, I was getting, you know, insane amounts of beans and whatever. I think um, in the future, Chef Boyardee is king. And uh, Goya. <laughs> I have a lot of Goya product at home. You still eat Chef Boyardee, which is so weird. Hmm? Don't you still eat? You still eat Chef Boyardee sometimes. I do, and it's tragic because... That is tragic. I actually have, during the pandemic, when a lot of Chinese restaurants were closed and a lot of, you know, um, takeout restaurants were closed, I, I know how to cook, and I did get a lot of food, but once in a while, you just want to be able to open something up quickly and eat it, especially if you're working on a deadline at the art table. And I had Chef Boyardee spaghetti and meatballs. I don't even heat it up. I eat it out of the can, pop it open. It doesn't taste Italian at all. I don't know what that flavor is. I think it's the color gray that I'm eating. You know? There's so many other things. Oh, my gosh. But I also think it's a carryover of my childhood or something like I mean, I, I ate well in my childhood, but there's just like a carryover of you know, like Del Monte beans and like all this canned food product, yeah. you know, that yeah. you pop open and just throw and heat it up. You know, throw in a pot and heat it up or something like that. I don't know. And it felt like survival food. Mm-hmm. You know, I keep a, 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 a jar of peanut butter in every studio I'm at. At least that's the one food oh, product yeah. that I have. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers um, Gil's question. I don't think so, but it's a, we tried. Gil, we really tried. <laughs> we tried, Gil. Well, I got to tell you, listening to all those guests, it just makes me feel like a goddamn heel for giving such a, a depressing intro. I mean... These guys were great. It, it was a blast to to have so many people share these pieces of their lives with me, with us. And it, you know, it has me thinking about all the, the, the wonderful stuff the podcast has given me. I alluded to that earlier, but but it's true. And maybe that's the, the, the Rilkean moment, the, the creating this show is what changed my life. It's given me so much. And I'm I'm so happy to have made so many friends and, and pals through it, guests and listeners and PR people and, and all the others whose lives have intersected with mine because of the virtual memory show. And another thing, I know I said it was three dozen responses uh, at the end of the intro, but while I was playing all of these back and editing all the submissions and lining everything up, more kept coming in. So I had to rejigger the sequence so I could include those too. But but again, these were people who wanted to be part of this, people I'd gotten to meet through the podcast. And, and most importantly, they were people who only respond to emails that say, last call. But anyway, I love you guys. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. Thank you for listening. We'll be back later this week with a, a regular episode of the show. I promise. For now, here's to 50. Let's let Hal May 4th take us out of here. 